rising seawaters, coastal crisis, is it real or is it just made up? Well, today we'll find out when our world leading sea level rise expert, John Englander, talks to us about the crisis that is already here. Many politicians believe this is the biggest threat to every nation and the world. And then others think it's just a made up political talking point. Well, today, John Englander, who is an oceanographer, who has a broad marine science background, coupled with explorations to Greenland and Antarctica, allows him to see the big picture of the sea level rise and its societal impacts. And for over 30 years, a leader in the private and nonprofit sector, serving as the CEO for such noteworthy organizations as the International Sea Keepers and the Cousteau Society. We're so excited. This is Truth Be Told. I'm Tony Sweet with Captain Ron and special guest co-host, Dr. Gray Staffer. So please welcome to Truth Be Told, the one and only John Englander. There they are. Thank you. The people that actually went to college. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for doing the show. Uh, we've been wanting to talk about this subject for a long time. I've This is probably 550th episode that we've done, and we've never talked about it, but this is one of the subjects that honestly ha that is so important to not just us in this room or in, uh, through Zoom, or but everybody that's listening in this whole world. Uh, as we you know, getting ready to elect possibly a new uh, president. Uh, this is one of the main tops, topics of global warming and climate change. And, and uh, John, I'm glad you're here. Gray, I'm glad you're here because uh, you guys uh, are, are on the forefront. Uh, I know, John, you're there, but uh, Gray, you're, you're dealing with a lot of uh, animals and mammals that are going extinct, not just because of uh, humans, but also because of climate. So, that's why I want to have you both here. But, uh, John, let's get right to it. I mean, you, you wrote a book, and, uh, and it's done very, very well, and people are really taking note. And uh, I, want, I want to start with talking about the book. It's called High Tide on Main Street, Rising Sea Level, and the Coming Coastal Crisis. You say coming, or is it already here waiting for us to either do something about it or pay the consequences? Well, it started. The sea's uh, well documented to be rising uh, about eight or 10 inches over the last century. The problem is the rate of acceleration, which is kind of um, deceptive and easy to miss, but it's that uh, the, the time for the rate to double or go exponential that's going to surprise us. Because if we look back in geologic history, we know that sea level moves up and down tens or hundreds of feet. And we're totally unprepared for that, of course. We've had about 5,000 years of stable sea level, which has kind of fooled us into thinking the shoreline is going to stay in the same place we've always thought it to be. And uh, the fact is, sea level changes naturally, shorelines change with it. But now we've entered a new era when we're triggering the cause. Well, how, how long has this been going on? I mean, we, we act like it's just been in the last 20 years that, you know, the ice caps are starting to melt and... And we just now started noticing it. But has this been going on for a while? Because it seems to be r rapid pace. I mean, is, is this something that's been going on for centuries or just something in the last few decades? Well, so let's look at it in three different time frames. We've had uh, ice ages, what we think of as ice ages, for 2.58 million years. That's the geologic definition of the Pleistocene. Since we, uh, you know, we've all seen the kids' cartoons and so on, but right. we know that the ice ages are real. And that's been happening every 100,000 years on a natural cycle. So we look back in geologic history, that's unambiguous. The problem is that the 400 vertical feet, 120 meters, that sea level goes up and down with the ice ages as the ice sheets get bigger and smaller. We didn't see that until recently because for 5,000 years, we were at the turning point. We were at the end of the 20,000 year rising phase and should have been entering the 80,000 year falling phase. And again, we're talking about 400 feet of vertical change of sea level. But what we didn't know until about 100 years ago is that how that pattern really worked and what drove it. And as a result, the 5,000 years of human civilization was the turning point between the up phase and the down phase mm. and looked pretty flat. So now we've changed that. We should have been entering the cooling phase when the ice would be getting bigger and sea level would be falling. But instead, for the last 200 years, as was well 
uh, documented and, and actually warned about. If we keep adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we're going to warm the planet and melt the ice and sea level is going to go higher instead of the natural lower. So we're that's why we're confused. Yeah, I uh, I mean, living in California, you, you say you're living in Florida. Gray's a little more safe there in Arizona. But uh, this is something that's always on our mind. But it's not one thing that I saw in your book that you were talking about uh, in High Tide on Main Street. But it's just it's not just the coastal regions that we're worried worried about. Is that correct? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, whether you live in Denver or Geneva, Switzerland, I mean, your your goods come by ports, and our whole gl global economy and financial system is predicated on valuable assets, most of which are in the coastal area. Right. So the whole world is dependent upon the coastline for shipping and fishing and recreation and cruise ships and all the things we do in coastal environments. And even in Arizona, you, you know, your goods for Walmart and uh, uh, Costco come in through right. ports and those <laughs> ports, uh, we ship most goods by, by ship for obvious reasons. So this is gonna affect everybody in the world. It's gonna affect the world economy, uh, humanitarian issues. There's about a billion people out of the nearly 8 billion people on earth that are vulnerable in coastal zones, but pretty much everybody will be affected. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I'm originally from the Midwest, and they're getting these, you know, historic floods that uh, I know are, are just devastating many people. And even uh, I've heard about, uh, and I think also in your book, was talking about uh, just, oh, actually, there was an insurance guy on one of our shows, not my show, but another show, and they were talking about because of the fires and the floods that the prices mm -hmm. of, of insurance are getting to the point where nobody can even afford it. And I think the, you know, we don't see the, the effects of this so immediately, but, we're, but it's really hitting us in the pocketbook where uh, they're like, oh, it's just the fires. Well, no, it's because of the climate change that's affecting us. Gray, I want to mm -hmm. ask you, I mean working with animals and 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 I know with Carolyn Hennessy with her show Animal Magnetism we talk about the the, the increase of extinction of animals uh, due to human human uh, you know influence but don't you agree that you know our our influence and then the natural changes that are are really becoming so uh, catastrophic to the animal kingdom too well, we've certainly seen that borne out over the last 50 years of my professional lifetime where, you know, the average decline in populations is 60% over the last 50 years. And that's according to studies that have been published in the last few years. So we've seen a dramatic decline, not, not only in species biodiversity, but in abundance. Hmm. And so my question today is, what sort of species will be most critically impacted by uh, the change in, in, in the sea levels? Uh, in those coastal areas, because those are very rich in wildlife, of course. So I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what our guest thinks about as far as the most impacted species other than human beings. That's a great question. The most impacted species other than humans. Um, from climate change in general or sea level rise? Either one. Um, you know, the whole marine ecosystem because the, it will be affected by sea rise because the estuaries where the larval yeah. breeding grounds, the mangroves and the, you know, the shallow waters where the uh, where most larvae and, and fish and crabs and all the uh, swamps, even the, the Everglades and the Louisiana Bayou and, mm -hmm. and all these are even the, you know, San Francisco Bay estuary. Mm -hmm. um, all of that's dependent upon uh, the freshwater saltwater interface and as sea level accelerates, it's going to greatly disturb that whole marine ecosystem. So I, I don't want to single out one species for that. As you talk about the, um, you know, from fires to high temperatures, um, we're seeing the terrestrial impact, of course, from climate change more broadly. And um, the thing that I think is confusing about this, not only was the natural climate cycle of the Ice Age a 100,000 year cycle, been going on for two and a half million years that we was not in dispute by anybody i don't think but it's easy to see why we got confused because there was this twenty thousand year warming period and an eighty thousand year cooling period and we happened to be have our civilization at the five thousand year kind of turning point which fooled us but 
we're now at a new era. We're, you know, one degree Celsius, almost two degrees Fahrenheit warmer. The art, you know, the debate in the scientific community, the UN policy circles and the international community is whether to try and keep the warming to another degree Celsius or two. So double or triple what we've already had. Hmm. And you can essentially double those numbers for Fahrenheit, you know, more or less. Um, that's a huge change to the ecosystem, as you know. And, hmm. and um, we don't tolerate those. You know, we get fooled because we can tolerate 40 or 50 degrees from winter to summer and, you know, going skiing to being out at the beach. But when you change the, the, the parameters, a good, a good example is uh, the pine bark beetle. You know, we've lost hundreds of millions of pine trees in the uh, Western United States because of a beetle that used to get killed off in the wintertime, the pine bark beetle. Right. And now it's just enough warmer that they don't get killed off in the wintertime. So the valuable lodgepole pines that they made the, you know, the big famous uh, log, not log cabins, but the, those wooden wonderful houses out of the, out of, you know, huge pine trees are being decimated uh, because just a degree or two of warming temperature is not killing off the pine bark beetle in the wintertime. So who would have thought of that? You know, so it's just a great example of the pervasiveness and complexity of the impact of this on the ecosystem. Is, is it also the, the rate of change in the sea level rise and the temperature rises? Because, you know, nature has a way of adapting to subtle, slow, gradual changes. But is the real problem that we are just walloping the system and it's just its basic mechanism are not capable to absorb the change that fast? I think that's exactly right. It's speed of change. I mean, if sea level was to rise 10 feet in the next thousand years, we, we'd cope with that. That wouldn't be a problem. If it rises 10 feet in 100 years, we have a real problem uh, because just it's going to inundate coastal cities all over the world. We tend to want to associate it with Miami and Venice and New Orleans, but it's every coastal community. It's 10,000 coastal communities from Annapolis to Seattle and from Monaco to Manila and Copenhagen to Calcutta. We don't think like that. Well, look what happened in New York City a few years ago with a hurricane. I mean... No. Right. <laughs> Lower Manhattan was underwater. Yeah. So I like to say that we should think about the flood events like a hurricane, like and mm -hmm. Hurricane Sandy was a great example, um, or Katrina, or, I mean, not a terrible example, but Harvey, all the things we're seeing as events. We're seeing flooding at king tides, even in calm weather, without a storm, blue skies, no waves in the ocean, the water's getting higher all over the world. That's a tide cycle, but it's getting higher because sea level is getting higher, like a drip filling the bucket. So we tend to be on the lookout for the big events like mm -hmm. uh, Hurricane Harvey, Superstorm Sandy. But the insidious thing about sea level that we've never experienced before in 5,000 years of human civilization is this drip, drip, drip filling the bucket. And it's one thing on top of another. So as sea level rises by inch by inch, and then you get the next Hurricane uh, Sandy or Harvey you know, 20, 30 years from now, and the water heights, let's say five inches higher. It just means the water is going to reach even that much higher. And so it's a combination. It, it shows up as these king tide events, as they're called now, which is when the moon and uh, sun are in alignment right. closer. And we get these uh, at the new moon in January, we tend to get the extreme high tide. So it's complicated. And then it gets confused with coastal erosion, which of course is being more of a problem for a totally different reason. But all of those things are causing flooding, like you say, rainfall, storms, king tides, sea level rise, coastal erosion. And it all kind of threatens people in coastal communities all over the world. But they're actually different phenomena, but that makes it more challenging to understand. And again, we've never had sea level be higher. The last time sea level was higher was 122,000 years ago when it got 25 feet higher by nature, even without human impact. Really? Yeah. And I think this goes back to that question is, you know, like I said, you hear the both talking points is like, oh, this is just you know, nature taking over or or but it's not human influence. I mean, how do we know 100 percent? Because I hear this all the time. Well, the ozone, it healed itself. So, you know, it's fixed now. And, oh, you know, the trash doesn't really affect the, the oceans. It's a huge ocean. So we don't you know what's a little trash going to help or hurt. So. How do we know what is really affecting this change sure. so quickly? Well, you know, some people have an agenda. They have something they want people to believe. Right. You know, so I like to say that there's people who are confused and there's people who like to confuse. <laughs> and those are two different things. 
And the question is, are you somebody who's confused, honestly, and wants the right information? Or are you somebody who wants to sow confusion to distract or perhaps uh, support an industry that, that benefits you? And um, both happen. That's just natural, whether it be tobacco and smoking and cancer, whether it be uh, burning fossil fuels and sea level rise and the ice sheets melting. So uh, both are out there. Like most issues, we're tribal. We, we tend to take one side or another of an argument. Um, it took decades, 400 years ago, to, for the idea that the sun was the center of the solar system, you know, to be accepted. It didn't happen when Galileo uh, said it or Copernicus or, or uh, the other Kepler. Um, it takes a while to change scientific opinion. We're humans and we, we hold on to some concepts. But the facts are really simple. Any geologic uh, account, any textbook that been out for 50 years or more, talks about the ice ages and it was documented in the kids series the four part you know ice age the meltdown and and actually quite accurately and we had 10,000 feet of ice three kilometers two miles all over the north america all over the northern hemisphere as it melted sea level rose 400 feet but you turn that around you say that means 20,000 years ago during the peak of the last ice age when there was two miles of ice across the northern hemisphere north america europe asia Sea level was down 400 feet below now. Now, that's not an opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm not making that up. You can check that out in any book. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. We just didn't connect the dots. And the truth is, we didn't really know that till about 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So science evolved. And we have these mythologies. We may believe in the biblical or the, the Quranic tale of the flood, or that's also embodied in, in Native American cultures up in the Pacific Northwest describing how the water rose really quickly. Well, that ties in with 14,000 years ago when sea level rose 60 feet in 400 years. Wow. I, uh, so there's some people in the chat room. I'm going to ask some questions from them in a little bit. But uh, you've been to both uh, North and South Poles or Antarctica and Antarctica. Uh, which one is being uh, affected the most? Uh, is it North or South? Sure. Well, uh, great question. So the Arctic, uh, the North Pole is is just frozen ocean, although it's thawing very quickly. There's no land there. The big ice on land, besides a bit in Alaska, but is Greenland. Mm -hmm. Greenland holds enough ice that if it melts entirely, sea level will rise about 25 feet, mm -hmm. seven meters. Antarctica is seven times bigger. So that's 186 feet or uh, 56 meters. Okay. Um, but the big difference is that Antarctica is melting much more slowly. The heat is tending to go to the Arctic. And that's for a combination of, without getting complicated, but it's the ocean currents, the spin of the earth and the tilt of the earth um, tend to bring the heat to the Arctic, the North Pole area. And while the sea ice is melting and cruise ships and oil tankers are going across the Arctic now during summers, um, the big problem is the melting on Greenland with the ice on land, because it's the ice on land that can translate into sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And that's melting at a much faster pace. Ultimately, it's Antarctica is the problem, but Antarctica is lagging behind by 100 years. Is there a, is there a danger here in, um, you often hear this word overused in media, call a tipping point. And, and the reason I, I suggest that is because I've read that because there's less ice cover, you're getting less reflection of, of sunlight into the atmosphere. Therefore, you're getting um, uh, more light tra transmitted to the planet in warming, mm -hmm. which might compound the warming that's occurring because of the additional carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And so you can almost a positive loop situation. Absolutely right. So as you, you know, when we look at the maps of the, or the globe, the, the North Pole is white because it's covered by ice. It's been that way for 3 million years. So we mm -hmm. thought it was quasi-permanent. It's quickly melting, okay, and we know that. And as you said, when you go from bright white, which reflects light and heat, to dark blue, almost black, mm -hmm. it's like taking a white-roofed house or car and painting it black. It's going to absorb more heat. It's going to get warmer. It's very obvious to anybody. And that's what's happening to the planet. So as the Arctic melts, just as you say, it's, it's changing the albedo or the the reflectance is the simplest term, and we're absorbing more and more heat. It becomes a vicious cycle, and that's happening. In fact, the Arctic's two, two, three, or four times warmer than the global average now in terms of its rate of warming. So if the world on average has warmed about a degree in a century, almost a, so 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, call it two, um, 
you can triple that for the Arctic, which is the problem because as Greenland melts, that water is going all over the world. Mm -hmm. And it's so far, it's only, you know, fractions of an inch a year, but it's going to, it's going to become visible this century. And I think within 30 years, mid-century, there's not going to be any doubt that not only is sea level rising and the Arctic melting and Antarctic is going to kick in, but it's going to be the acceleration that's going to be the problem. Mm. Um, it's at the present rate of a quarter of an inch a year or so, it's not that big a problem. It's like the drip filling the bucket, but it's the acceleration rate. It will get back to inches a year like it was 14,000 years ago. And that's when the, the clarity of where this is headed is going to just scare the hell out of everybody. Well, can I, can I pick up on that real quickly? Because, um, you know, I often tell people that the earth will survive human beings. The question is whether or not human beings will survive and appreciate the earth. So let's play this out just in terms of what's happening to the earth. At some point, will the increased moisture lead to greater cloud cover and, and then eventually some cooling effect? And then we would start over and start building ice again. Is that the, kind of the progression? Well, there's two parts over to that. Great question. Form. Pardon? Over That's geologic true. kind of timeline. Yeah, no. So it's a great question. Well, it, the, the interaction with clouds is the most complicated thing to figure out. And again, we're at a warming point in the earth, which we humans have never seen before. The last time was this warmest. 10 million years ago there, more or less, okay? So while we measure it better now, we're understanding the complexity, what you described, the cloud cover is really complicated because as the oceans warm more, there's more moisture comes up in the air. Um, the, but the, the difference in cold and, and warm land versus ocean and currents makes the dynamics of clouds extremely complicated. Okay. And we keep doing better jobs of trying to understand them and model them and so on, but it's an experiment. I mean, we well, because of the melting of the Arctic and the currents changing and the El Ninos and La Ninas and the polar vortex, we've yeah. never had these things before. So we can do all the computer models we want, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're improving the models. But the, just like modeling anything, it's a model. It's not reality, okay? <laughs> so the cloud part is really the big question mark to me and, and a lot of scientists. The... Um, Here's a takeaway that, that may help to put the problem in perspective. Even if we could stop greenhouse gases today, the release of carbon dioxide, even if we could go to 100% solar, wind, nuclear, and hydro energy, so not burning any more fossil fuels, if we could stop the CO2 level at 410 parts per million, which is where it is now in 2019, um, sea level is still going to rise for centuries because the oceans have been warmed. So that heat that's been stored in the ocean is a buffer. It's like an outdoor swimming pool or lake, and it keeps its heat for a while. And so even if you turn the burner off on the stove, you know, the pot, the pot that with hot water in it, it's, okay, it's going to keep that heat. And so we've elevated the ocean temperature. That's really hard to do. We've warmed the oceans. <laughs> Congratulations to us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're running the experiment. Um, so we've got to think, I think we should think of climate change as three or four different things. One is how to slow the warming, the debate that's going on about how we make our energy. And I think we'll figure that out in the next 20, 30 years, how to make energy without adding to, to warming. I think we'll figure that out. Then there's the effect on the ecosystem, what Gray was talking about earlier, the, you know, what animals, plants, uh, marine life, and so on are going to be affected. Because you're not going to, even if you solve the energy problem and the greenhouse gases and reduce the carbon dioxide, you're not going to immediately get rid of that energy that's now stored in the ocean. And then sea level requires adaptation because as sea level rises and it's gonna rise five or 10 feet, we just don't know how soon, it's not gonna down for thousands of years. So we have to adapt to a new shoreline. Hmm. So we have three things to do with, with climate. We have to slow the warming, look at the ecosystem effects, begin to adapt to things like new shorelines as sea level rises. And then look at all the other peripheral issues of food supply and agriculture, um, insect populations, which are decimating, uh, bumblebees. The birds are off by 29%, I think, in the last 50 years was the recent wow. study. Right. That was We were warned about that 50 years ago by um, uh, Rachel Carson, that uh, persistent or organic uh, pesticides could, could decimate birds, and it's happening. So our whole ecosystem is changing. 
and we have to make enough food to feed nearly 8 billion people, um, it's going to be uncharted territory. I, I don't know if you've both seen this movie. I'm sure you have, The Day After Tomorrow, which I yes. remember I remember watching that movie and thought, oh, that's so far-fetched, which is now pretty much reality. Uh, because, well, of, well, I mean, in, in some aspects of it, but... But I just, you know, how the the, the uh, currents have changed, which yeah. caused, caused these, you know, solar or what do they call these big storms? The whatever they called them, uh, the EMPs, the electromagnetic pulse, or right? The, the they, they just solar you know, the, flares. Yes, these, and and I and I I just keep thinking about how uh, this is becoming somewhat reality. Uh, well, well, a little bit. Um, so. Just to put that in perspective, that was a, a fun, you know, disaster movie. Right, right, uh, right. And it was, it basically said that the Gulf Stream slows down because of climate change or stops. And three days later, New York's under 20 feet of ice, you know, like a new ice age. Right. That's not possible on that time scale. Um, so it's unrealistic and it creates an unrealistic expectation. But the Gulf Stream is slowing down. It's, done, it's slowed down by 15%. We think we know why, and it's because of the melting of Greenland and the fresh water entering the North Atlantic. Um, it seems to correlate. We'll know better in the next 10 or 20 years. But the Gulf Stream can't stop in three days, okay? Right. And even if it even if it does, it's not going to be as dramatic, of course, as the movie. But your basic point is right. We are seeing a change in currents that we took as per perpetual, like the Gulf Stream. Um, ocean currents and atmospheric, the jet stream the, in the atmosphere, even we're getting this polar vortex, which is the breakup of the normal jet stream in the wintertime um, because the Arctic's thawing. I mean, all of these things are connected. And, and for all of human history, which I call five or 6,000 years, if you go back to the biblical days, if you will, but really since we, you know, the Christian era is 2,000 years, if you get back about five or 6,000 years, that's pretty much human civilization. We've had weather anomalies. We've had lots of storms. We've had periods of fire and little ice ages and medieval warm periods and so on. But the ice ages were this 100,000 year cycle that have been going on for two and a half million years. Hmm. And we've now broken out of that. So you've got to look at things in the geologic time, the long time period, then our long scale, which might be a century, and then say what's happening year by year, you know, in a decade that we can design differently for. Um, but I, so I like to think of the threes always. I mean, I always break things into threes and the, the millions of years, we can see the pattern. We know the ice ages were a hundred thousand year cycle. Now, um, we now need to be worried about how much flooding can happen next year, whether it be new Orleans or Venice or Jakarta or San Francisco or Annapolis or Boston or Copenhagen or any, any other coastal city, we need to design differently for what could happen in the coming decades. And we need to see, we can see the future in the past, like any good history, if we know where to look. And it's a pretty daunting story, which is that 20,000 years ago, sea level was down 400 feet. 122,000 years ago, it was hot 25 feet higher. Hmm. So we just came along at the wrong time when sea level wasn't changing after the up period and before it was going to the down period. But now it's going to the super up period. So we have to learn a little bit of geology, but really think about how, how do we survive, as Gray was saying, as a species, because we're part of this ecosystem with food supply, our interaction with the animal kingdom, for everything from bumblebees to, uh, um, you know, farming, et cetera. And uh, we're in a brave new world. We've really got to, uh, we've got to try and slow it. We've got to begin adapting to it and figuring out what changes do we need to make to live in harmony with it while we try and rebalance it. And I, th I think a lot of these, uh, like you said, 10, 20, 30,000 years ago, these civilizations that we're finding, then they're like, well, you know, they kind of, where did they go? They disappeared. You know, we found their, their, the remains of their cities, but that we just don't know. The good thing about us living in this day and age is we do have a lot of technology that we can move a little bit easier, create something that's a little more protective of, of our society, but unfortunately, there's a lot of. I mean, look in the Indonesia, the the where they're moving the capital city. There's not a lot of. There's not a lot of money there to. Where in America we have a little bit more money and resources to do that. So 
you're right. I think it's you know it's it's kind of be the, sur- the survival of the fittest in in a way uh, when it comes to some of these cities and countries. So uh, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty sad, but that's reality. Are there are there technologies that exist currently that you think offer some promise? I mean, you've got you mentioned Copenhagen, but you you know you've got the Netherlands who you know they've they've been dealing with sea level rise issues for forever, and I know that they're experimenting with uh, more salt tolerant types of crops and that sort of thing. Do you see anything currently in play that might be able to be up you know upscaled a little bit or, or fast tracked? Well, it's a great question. And let's look at it in a couple of different parts. So the Netherlands has not been dealing with sea level rise very long, actually, even though people say that. For a thousand years, they've been reclaiming land from the water to make to expand their farmland. Okay. Yeah. And that goes back one thousand years, a little more than that, when they literally built earthen levees and used windmills to pump water out and they created these polders. Okay. So they they're good at that. And and the next evolution in the Netherlands was 1953 when this terrible storm happened one night. And it killed 1,800 people there and a couple hundred in England as well, up the Thames River. And so that's when they started re-engineering this Delta Works program. And they were worried about big storms, okay? Uh, so one is land recovery, low-lying land. Two is preparing for a storm. But even then, even with their big technology, the harbor gates at Rotterdam that everybody's seen, those semicircular gates, they planned for a foot of sea level rise this century. Oops. Now that they're planning on 10 feet of sea level rise as a maximum, <laughs> They have to rethink all that engineering. It wasn't designed for 10 feet of sea level rise. Okay. So it's a great example. They have wonderful engineering and technology, but even the Netherlands has not prepared for sea, for three meters or 10 feet of sea level rise. And they're working on it. But uh, countries like Singapore, I just came back from Singapore a month ago and uh, I was really almost by uh, surprise to me. The prime minister had just given his national day speech to the nation, five and a half million people, a very vibrant economy in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, he said, the biggest threat we face this, this century is rising sea level. I just fell off my chair when I, when I heard it. And uh, hmm. But they're very futuristic. They, they think about a century very easily. We don't think about a century very easily. We think, we think a year is a long time in, in America. Uh, but the Asians and some Europeans, but the Asians in particular, the Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and Singaporeans, they can think about a hundred years. They think of the thousand years of a dynasty. And uh, they're now planning their new airport terminal in Singapore, five meters, 16 feet above sea level. Mm. Wow. They, they see the long arc of history and they're an island nation, quite small with five and a half million people. So they're taking it very seriously. Uh, there's a lot of people in the chat room that have been asking this and I, I even, crossed my mind. Uh, what do you think about uh, the polar shift? There's a lot of talk about polar shift. Could that be part? You mean the magnetic pole? Yeah, the ma- magnetic pole has been moving. Do you think that has any bearing on what we're going through with uh, the change? Yeah. It, it, so the magnetic pole is due to, there's a big load of iron. It's, uh, it's about a thousand miles south of the North Pole uh, in Northern Canada. And it's the location of that mass of iron that really uh, determines the our magnetic polarity. Um, it has sh- flipped or shifted, uh, we know through geologic history, it takes about 1,500 years for it to flip. Hmm. Um, it normally migrates. Any pilot or boat captain knows that a compass has to be uh, adjusted for its... Um, uh, deviation and, and um, um, forgetting the la- the other term, but but it's to it's to take yeah yes it, it's to take account of the difference between the the physical North Pole and the magnetic North Pole, and it changes over time. When I started flying airplanes 30 or 40 years ago, I mean it was like five five degrees, and then it was by by the 30 years later it was seven degrees. Okay, so that's natural. Uh, that's happened throughout geologic time. Now, because the Earth's got this molten core and we're spinning around, what, 1,700 miles an hour or something like that. And, and so there's going to be shifts and that's entirely natural. Now, it's happening faster at the moment and there's some question why. But that's not climate change. That's not what's going on here. We, this was predicted 200 years ago that if you put enough carbon dioxide in the air, it was demonstrated in London in 1859 by John Tyndall that uh, they could prove the amount of heating that would take place with carbon dioxide in doubling. Okay. Wow. This is not a surprise. We know we've proven it. It's laboratory experiments. 
It's Alexander Graham Bell warned, warned about this in 1917. The inventor of the telephone warned us that if we didn't explore so solar energy, we were going to warm the planet by burning fossil fuels. Okay, so this isn't a surprise. There's a lot of people who want to have disinformation, who don't want to face this for one reason or another. But the fact is, we know why the planet's warming. This is not because of magnetic shifts. That's a different issue. Uh, the, 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 the changes in the uh, ecosystems, you know, are, are important. There's lots of things going on here. Uh, weather changes, as, as we said earlier, as Gray was mentioning. Um, that, so it's a very complex world. I like sea level as a particular focus because it has a real clarity. It's binary. Something's above water or underwater. And we can find ancient villages that are now 100 feet underwater. We can find shark's teeth that are high above water. You know, we can go back and we can really decode sea level rise. And sea level determines the shoreline. And no matter what somebody believes politically or they want to have happen, even President Trump has Mar-a-Lago, not far from here in Florida, you know, his winter winter White House or whatever, his club. Well, it's about 14 feet above sea level. So he's a little high and dry for a while. But people here in Florida are getting very concerned about rising waters. And, and what, I mean, just the little time we have left, what can we do now as a, or what should we, like, people in Malibu here in California, should they, you know, start preparing for you know, migrating in or, I mean, how, how far should we start looking into moving now instead of waiting till the last minute? Sure. Great question. So again, we break the climate concerns into three things. One is we should have policies to reduce the warming, which means restricting the carbon dioxide or trying to take it out of the atmosphere. Right. And that's a good idea that eventually will slow the warning, but not quickly. Two is we should be prepared for more extreme weather. That's wildfires in California, like Malibu, but it's, it's um, strange storms, extreme storms, extreme rainfall, like Hurricane Harvey had more rain come down in three days than was, was thought physically possible uh, from the atmosphere. So be prepared for extreme weather events and then begin anticipating sea level rise. Sea level rise can't rise a foot in the next 20 years. It's just not, they can't melt that much ice that quickly. But we need to think differently. We need to do things like change building codes. When people say, "What should be practical, John, what should we do? I say, the first thing to do is add three feet or a meter to all building codes on the coast. I mean, it's going to be disruptive and it's hard to get the architecture right and make things look good and streets, the water drainage flowing in the right direction. But if we're going to have five or 10 feet of sea level rise this century, which I think we will, but it's going to accelerate, it's not going to happen quickly. The first thing to do is get our mind straight that sea level of the past isn't sea level of the future. Now, the time to adapt to that isn't when the water has risen. The time <laughs> yeah. to adapt to that is when you know that it's going to rise five or 10 feet in the next 100 years. We don't want to do that, though. The truth is we like the coast being where it is. We like sea level being where it is. We're very fond of it. You know, we'd like it to stay where it belongs. But in geologic history, again, not just by John Englander's account, any geologic textbook, even the Ice Age movies, the four-part kid series, talks about sea level moving up and down hundreds of feet. We need to embrace that. And I, and I think you, like you said earlier, you know, even a thousand years to us is a long time, but when it comes to the, 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 the age of the earth and the atmosphere, this it's nothing. I mean, so it's, right. yeah. And I think uh, we have to really think about how we look at that and, and it's scary, and like I said, we hear it almost every day in the news or in the, you know, even the debate last night. You could hear that was constantly coming up. So it's it's putting it in our mind, but we just don't really see a lot that's happening. Uh, I mean, we even in Kansas, where I'm from originally, they're they they have like windmills everywhere, but you know, again, we have back and forth people fighting. Oh, it's causes cancer. Oh, it's not not as much as what uh, can be done. So I think it's just confused. And that's why we need people like you and, and to really explain this to us. Uh, you know, some people are going to believe it. Some people are not. Unfortunately, in 100 years when this is happening, m most of us probably won't even be here anyway, <laughs> unless you believe in reincarnation. But uh, 
I really appreciate. Well, that's right. No, and that, that's a good metaphor, by the way, or analogy. And and I and I use that. I say, you know, the truth is, we're going to die at some point. I mean, that's life. You know, right. let's be real. Now, some people may not be concerned about that because they're religious beliefs. That's wonderful. Right. Um, they can they decide. But the fact is, we know that we're going to die. We can take care of ourselves. We can worry about our health. We can have uh, life insurance. We can do estate planning. We can, you know, prepare our loved ones. Right. But there's some things that just are going to happen, and we know that. We don't know when. Uh, life insurance may predict we're going to live 23 and a half more years, but that's just a prediction. It's a projection. It's not, it's not a prediction. In fact, it's just a, a probability projection. Right. And we need to understand that we deal with those all the time, uh, projections and estimates, but they're, they're not predictions of what's going to happen. And predicting sea level rise is an imprecise science because it's hard to say how much of Antarctica and Greenland are going to melt in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And before we get out of here, what was it? What was it like for the first time when you realized, you know, going? Because, like you said, Gray and I don't get to go up to the North and South Pole, but you've been there. So, what was it like to really see this for the first time? The effects of it was it scary? Was it uh, exciting just to be there? Well, I mean, what was it going through your mind when you realized what's what's really going on and happening? Well, just to quickly break it down into into three examples because they're they're all different. So. I first understood about sea level change almost 50 years ago in college, but I was doing some work, uh, oceanographic research, and I found ancient shorelines now 200 feet underwater in the Bahamas, um, and we dated them to 15,000 years ago. So I knew sea level changed hundreds of feet, like I say, almost 50 years ago, but then didn't think it was going to change my lifetime. The first time I was in the Arctic diving was uh, 1985, and we had 10 feet of ice to drill through because that was the common ice thickness in the Arctic at that time. Um, along the way, we had some Inuit or Eskimo guides and um, we lost a snowmobile because the ice was unusually thin and they were very perplexed why this had happened. But um, it was the beginning of the evidence that the Arctic was acting abnormally. Hmm. Um, but I still didn't appreciate what was happening. It really wasn't until 2007 when I went back to Greenland and um, all of the pieces started fitting together. And I realized that the size of the ice sheets and glaciers was changing and would relate to sea level rise and was part and parcel of a warming planet. And I, that was my aha moment. I write about it in my book in the preface. Um, it was my epiphany, really. And it just it came to me like a, a bolt of lightning that how this all came together. And sea level was a way to explain climate change that most people would accept because of the clarity that ice melts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And it has changed and it is changing. And what does that mean as we melt enough ice on land and raise sea level? Well, I mean, great information. I I really appreciate you spending time with us today. This was so interesting, interesting. And I, uh, I hope we have you back and hopefully it's not because of uh, some tragedy. (laughs) I hope it's just something that you can educate uh, all of us. So, uh, well, well, thank you, Tony and and Gray. It's been great to work with you. And I have a new book coming out next year. Oh, what is um, it? So maybe we'll do. It's, it's called Moving to Higher Ground. It's about <laughs> adaptation. So uh, maybe when that's out, be a great opportunity to come back on. Love it, love it. And people can go. I know you have two different websites. Which one do you uh, would like them to go to? The simplest one is johnenglander.net. Okay. It's, uh, it's it's kind of got my book and my speaking, and uh, it's got a blog. And if people want a free weekly. A kind of update on what's happening from around the world they can sign up there and there's no ads and the names are protected um so john englander.net great and gray i know uh dr gray stafford he's in arizona and, and he has uh, his own podcast would love to promote that real quick well thanks tony it's called zoologic two words and uh we are we don't talk about uh sea level rise but maybe we should so thanks john for your time today you're welcome Gray. great to meet you love to work with you in the future and everybody in the chat room, thank you guys so much for participating. Was uh, Captain Ron and I always, always, always love having you participate. Uh, believe it or not, you know this always starts the conversation, and that's why we say truth be told because you know your truth is your your discovery, and your discovery is finding it out for yourself. Go do your research, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll share this show and subscribe to our channel. Uh, do it, iHeartRadio podcast, any place you, we podcast, you can subscribe. So. Until next time, I'm Tony Sweet uh, with uh, 
Dr. Grace Stafford, John Englander, and for Captain Ron, I, I, like I said, this was one of those shows where I've been wanting to do for a long time, and I'm so happy we did it. So take care, Thanks. and we'll see you next time. Great.